Brighton is a professor at UIUC. He's a technical director at VMware. Um, he's perhaps well known for his very successful startup called Veriflow. Um, he was a CTO of Veriflow for uh, many years until it got acquired by VMware. Um, his research interests are sort of the systems and algorithms with a little bit of touch of verification recently. He's got many awards and papers. And maybe one of his most well-known works is uh, that to change the way that we think about networks with the rate control algorithms in the internet. And so we're very excited to have you, Brighton, and to hear your thoughts on this rate control algorithms. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for uh, the invitation to speak. So we'll be talking about some adventures in learning-based rate control. And um, this is a project that's been co-led with uh, UIUC and uh, my collaborators at Hebrew University, particularly Michael Shapiro's group. So uh, big thanks to, to him and all of the students at both uh, universities that, um, that really did the, the real work in all of this, including many of the slides you'll see. <clears throat> okay, so... This, is a, this has been a, a long running project that um, really began when we looked at one of the core protocols on the internet, congestion control, uh, particularly TCP congestion control, foundational to you know, almost all communication on the internet. Um, and uh, of course it's been established, it's widely used, the internet is running. Um, if you don't like your default congestion controller, which might be cubic, then you have a lot of other choices uh, designed for different environments. So, you know, who could possibly be unhappy with TCP? Well, um, we looked at this at, at the time we were starting this project, and it turned out there were, a, a, in, in the real world, uh, a lot of companies that had to get work done, and TCP wasn't cutting it. Um, this was a, a selection of companies that uh, were uh, customers of a uh, transport acceleration company at the time. Um, <clears throat> so what's going on with that? Well, many of these TCP protocols are, are point solutions designed for some specific environment. And in addition, we found that they're often pretty far from optimal um, in their particular environments. Of course, there's uh, well-known problems like TCP reacts to a packet loss uh, that may or may not be an indication of congestion, but there's a lot of other issues uh, as well. So what's going on there? Why does traditional congestion control architecture struggle in many cases? Um, here's some intuition, which is uh, the way I look at it. So um, <clears throat> take a protocol like TCP Reno, it sees a packet loss, it'll cut its congestion window in two, which basically if you're not familiar with TCP details, it, it cuts the sending rate in half. Uh, cubic, uh, if a millisecond of time passes, it'll increase the congestion window by one and so on. So there's many other specific rules where there's some event that occurs, generally a packet level event, and that triggers a certain action as a result of that event. And it's a hardwired mapping from these events to actions. Um, <clears throat> The problem is if we take an event like this, that event is not the same as the underlying conditions in the network. So for example, let's say we saw that one packet loss happened. Well, it could be that this flow is causing most of the congestion in the network, in which case decreasing the rate significantly, the sending rate is the right thing to do. But it could also be that there is a shallow buffer in uh, a bottleneck in the network and there are microbursts that occasionally fill that shallow buffer. So you might want to decrease, decrease your rate a little, but not a lot. Or it could be that some other flow is uh, congesting the network, in which case you would want to maintain your rate. Or it could be that there's random non-congestion loss, in which case you may want to increase your rate, okay? So it should be clear now that if we look at that one observed event of a packet loss, um, <clears throat> it's not gonna be possible to have a hardwired mapping from that event to one action that does the right thing. It's just not enough information about what's happening in the network. Um, so let's take a step back and take more of like a, a scientific view, if you will, and say, okay, well, the network is a black box. We're not quite sure what's happening inside. 
but we can send at some rate and we can see what happens, right? We can do a little experiment. We can do many different experiments with different rates and um, then have some concrete evidence of what rate might be, uh, might be most beneficial to send, okay? So in a little bit more detail, we're gonna send it some rate and we're gonna collect some observations over a period of time, maybe about one round trip time. You can think maybe like 30 milliseconds if we're on the public internet. When we do that, we'll see throughput, we'll see loss rate, we'll see latency and so on from um, that uh, short period of time where we sent at a certain rate. And we can summarize that in a utility. How happy are we overall? Like for example, we'd wanna maximize throughput and minimize loss rate and so on. Okay, now if we do that, then we know that that rate produced that utility, at least at that time, but that's not enough to make a decision we have to at least send two different rates and then compare the utility values and move in the direction of the rate that produced higher utility. So that's kind of like the core of the idea of a uh, control algorithm here that's based on observations. Um, here's an example just to, to make it clear about how this could help. So let's say inside the black box, is the, the situation is that this flow is causing most congestion. Uh, we can't directly observe that, but if we send at the lower rate and then we send at the higher rate here, we'll actually see a higher um, fraction of packet loss when we send at the higher rate. And so that might make us say, okay, I actually prefer the lower rate in that case. But if it's random loss going on inside, then when we send at a higher rate, we won't see a higher ran, um, percentage of packets lost. Um, and we'll say, well, okay, I, it, given that, since the loss rate hasn't gone up, I prefer to actually send at the higher rate. So effectively it's doing the right thing in these two different situations, even though it can't directly observe the, the, the underlying state, we can nevertheless um, take the right action. So really this is a change in perspective. The traditional perspective for many um, uh, congestion control protocols is that, well, let's assume at least a basic simple network model, craft some, some rules that, are, that do the right thing and, and get us predictable results. And this change of perspective is it's more of a black box perspective. The world is complex. We're not sure what's happening. There are hundreds, thousands of devices. There are load balancers. There are different sorts of rate limiters, software um, network elements with uh, one kind of buffering and physical elements with another. Uh, things are changing all the time. Uh, so the world is complex, but if we quantify our goal, and observe the effect of our actions, then we might get a good decision. <clears throat> so this perspective is really a good fit for learning. Um, it doesn't make it easy though. We have a big diversity of environments. Um, it's opaque, we can't exactly see what's going on. We get a trickle of information. Every time you send a packet and you get an acknowledgement back, um, you get a few bits of information there. Uh, and we're, we have to infer <clears throat> what's a good action at millisecond level time scales. So it's really a challenging problem, really fundamentally so. And I think this is a reason that it's, um, you know, uh, perhaps an underappreciated uh, problem, how, how subtly difficult congestion control is for these reasons, especially on, you know, large networks like the internet. Let's make this a little bit more concrete. And, and this is what uh, we introduced in this paper, PCC. Um, <clears throat> We're going to be working mostly with the sender of data. The sender decides how quickly to transmit. The receiver sends back acknowledgments that let us compute these metrics, throughput, loss rate, and so on, summarize them in a utility function, and then give that to the control module. So the control module is seeing, okay, I sent at this rate, this was the result. I sent at this for other rate, this was the result, and so on. And hopefully you can learn from that and steer the rate towards whatever maximizes the utility function. <laughs> So we need some sort of control algorithm there that's doing that steering. What we started with was a very simple online learning control algorithm, um, which basically 
sent at different rates and had a heuristic hill climbing algorithm that tried to see where the utility was maximized and stay there. <clears throat> um, one thing we did was to augment that with uh, recognizing the fact that when you send at a certain rate for a very brief period of time, there's going to be noise in that measurement. So you're not really sure if what you saw is the, the underlying truth or, or just some of that noise. Um, so we used randomized controlled trials uh, so you can try different rates in random order and get better information about if that rate was actually the cause of the effect that you saw. Uh, now, there, I, I want to acknowledge that there's an elephant in the room here if we use this approach for congestion control, which is where is the congestion control? What I just told you was a sender selfishly maximizing its own, um, uh, its own utility. <clears throat> so when does it... When does it back off? When is it nice and friendly to the other senders? Uh, and the answer there is really in the utility functions. This becomes a non-cooperative game. And the equilibrium, if there is one, depends on the choice of utility functions. So you have to choose a good utility function from a certain class of utility functions. <clears throat> now, if you do that, we got some very promising results. Uh, you might think that, um, a selfish mechanism for uh, controlling rate would fluctuate a lot, but this is an example of TCP with multiple senders across time. You can see fluctuations in rate, and this is an example with PCC. So still some variance, but actually much more stable because it's making good decisions. We also saw pretty promising results in um, tolerance to random packet loss and using uh, small queues. I'm, I'm going through this pretty quickly, uh, so just giving a small sample. Uh, also, in raw throughput, especially across the public internet, uh, often seeing um, order of magnitude improvements compared to uh, TCP cubic. But really, this was just the beginning because it, it's an architecture, right? You have a utility function and you have a control algorithm. And each of these now you can study and upgrade and, and drop in something that meets your needs. And these are gonna be the, uh, some of the adventures that we'll talk about for, uh, for the rest of this talk. The first thing we did was kind of upgrade both of those components by leveraging tools from online learning theory. Um, which included a new utility function framework and a new control algorithm that used gradient descent. Um, and the utility function was able to take into account latency, which we hadn't, um, we hadn't uh, done before. And this uh, produced pretty, pretty nice results. Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, buffer size in network bottleneck on the x-axis and RTT inflation on the y-axis. In other words, how much are you backing up the queues, basically? And um, <clears throat> you can see uh, PCC Vivace on the bottom here was able to keep that quite low across the whole range of buffer sizes compared to these other protocols. But I do want to say that um, it doesn't get optimal performance all the time. And a particularly challenging area actually is um, very dynamic networks like might uh, occur in some wireless conditions. Uh, and in the trade-off space here, throughput on the y-axis and latency on the x-axis, you'd, you'd like to be in the upper left corner. Um, and it, the, the approach here was not really doing what you would probably say is the, the best choice among these, these algorithms. So I'll mention a little bit later um, one of the challenges of, um, of why that is. Okay, so if our control algorithm isn't uh, doing as well as it might, maybe deep learning can save us. Um, so since we have factored out utility and control algorithms and in the overall protocol, it becomes easier to drop in a new, a new control algorithm, uh, which we, um, which we uh, took a crack at here uh, with this Aurora design, which basically took PCC and put a uh, a deep learning model as the control algorithm. So uh, briefly, uh, the inputs and outputs of this. So the inputs were a series of, of uh, statistics from monitor intervals. Monitor interval is one of those 
periods where you're making a decision and then observing for, let's say, 30 milliseconds, something like that. So across several of those monitor, uh, monitor intervals, you can see the performance and control actions uh, that was fed into the network and it outputs a rate change factor. So one thing to note here is that we used scale-free values in the inputs and the outputs to make this more robust to different conditions on the network. Um, we also took a look at what history length works well, and you do want some history here. Um, greater than one monitor interval was in fact useful, but um, you don't, em empirically anyway, you don't need a long history. To train this, we, uh, we used a simulated environment, which was, um, as you might expect, much faster to train than emulation. Uh, and this is in, in an open AI gem environment, which we've released. Um, one interesting question is how to set the discount factor, which um, uh, controls how, it, how much it weights expected cumulative discounted return of, of the future. Uh, and uh, that actually made a pretty significant difference there. And we ended up using this 0.99 value. When we went to test though, we moved to emulation. So this was sending packets through um, Linux kernel, um, Linux kernel based network emulation. Uh, so it's, it's actually running the code, it's sending packets. It's, we were testing also a much wider range of parameters than what we trained on, uh, but it is a single flow on the bottleneck. Um, so these results were, were pretty promising. What I'm showing here is um, a test where we're just varying the throughput in the bottleneck. So you can see that in the black line, that, uh, that square wave there. And TCP cubic actually reacts pretty slowly to those changes. It's kind of conservative. Um, and whereas the RL-based agent was, was able to learn to react quite quickly and does a very good job of tracking that <clears throat> change in bandwidth across time. Looking at a comparison with a number of other protocols and latency versus throughput, um, again, we'd, we'd like to be in the upper left corner here, high throughput and low latency. Um, it produced a result that was on the Pareto curve of, of what we found were the, the best performing protocols in this scenario. <clears throat> and in particular, it's uh, strictly better than PCC Vivace, which is our earlier protocol in this uh, environment. So that was a, uh, we thought a, a pretty promising result. It was not easy to get there. And there, there's a lot of work left for the future. For example, multi-agent scenarios uh, and training online, seeing if you can learn or specialize the model as you go would be pretty interesting directions. So what we just talked about were some improvements uh, in the control algorithm. Another thing you can do is change the utility function and using uh, doing that lets you perhaps um, um, tackle a new use case that you couldn't before. And so we looked at that for the case of scavenger transport. Um, so what is scavenger transport? So there's many different applications on the internet. Uh, we use all of these, uh, and um, but they have different requirements. It's not just all um, throughput or, or latency. Uh, in particular, some applications have more inelastic timing, like uh, we're using Zoom right now. We need bandwidth because I'm speaking uh, and you're listening in the moment. Uh, on the other hand, other applications have more elastic timing, like let's say um, software update. You probably don't even know when your software update is happening on your phone. Things just happen automatically. And so you could drop in a scavenger transport there, which has the goal of yielding to other primary flows, if there are other flows on the network, uh, to hopefully help them out. But when there is capacity on the network, you'd like to get high performance. You'd like to utilize spare capacity. And also, we have the goal of flexibility. The, uh, so the application can switch between these modes, and the protocol should be implemented ideally in one code base to be able to do that dynamically. So the approach we took um, had some improvements to the control algorithm, but especially in the utility function. And so that's what I'll mention just, uh, just briefly. What we used was basically to uh, take a signal of 
competition and drop it in as a, a penalty in the utility function. What we used for that signal was RTT deviation, which is standard deviation of the RTT samples of packets. The intuition here is that it's an earlier signal of the dynamics in the network. So if you imagine uh, we have a link that's getting congested, more and more congested across time as we move over to the right here. Initially, uh, if you're a flow on this link, you'll see some variation in RTT, but it'll be pretty stable. And then a competitor will begin and you'll initially see some fluctuation before the com uh, competitor ramps up significantly, at which point you would then see the gradient, the slope of this, uh, these RTTs increasing. And then eventually you'd see the bottleneck fully utilized. Okay, so this, there, there is an existing scavenger protocol called Leadbat, it's deployed uh, in production by Microsoft and others. And um, that, that can be useful, but it's using kind of a late signal here. And so we wanted to pick a signal that's, that's earlier to be as um, conservative as possible in yielding to other flows. And this produced some pretty good results. So what we're looking at here is um, how is a video sender using uh, Dash, which is an HTTP based approach to delivering video, um, how is that sender affected by a potential background flow? So on the top in the black line is when there's only the video um, receiver, sender and receiver, Dash. And if you turn on a Proteus-based uh, scavenger in the background, it stays pretty close, right? So basically the, that, um, that Dash uh, communicating pair is not affected. Compared to Leadbat and a, a regular qubit flow, there's a much bigger hit to the primary flow. And fairly similar results on the right here for page load time in web pages. It's, uh, there's a slight increase in load time uh, with the background flow, but, uh, but, but very small for, for Proteus and somewhat larger for the other approaches. But it gets even better um, because if you're able to to change the utility function dynamically and specialize it for an application, you can do more. You can say, first of all, my utility function is gonna be a scavenger up to some threshold where the application needs that much bandwidth, definitely, but then it would like more if it happens to be conveniently available. So that's what this utility function is doing. Um, we used this for the case of video delivery and uh, set that threshold dynamically based on the application requirements, specifically, basically buffer occupancy. I'm not gonna go into the details here. Um, what's interesting now is there's no um, low priority or high priority flows. So in, in the results I'm about to show you, it's all a bunch of video delivery senders. Um, but by using um, uh, this hybrid mode, they're able to basically help each other out, help each other get the bandwidth when they need it and not be as aggressive when they don't need it. And this ended up uh, improving quality of experience. Specifically, we're looking at rebuffering ratio here on the y-axis uh, for both this 4K video and a simultaneous um, uh, 1080p video in this particular test. Okay, um, the last thing I want to mention quickly, uh, if I think there's probably just a few more minutes, so I'll go over this uh, quickly here, <clears throat> um, is as we design these protocols, there's an important question of robustness that comes up. We, we don't know necessarily exactly what a learning agent is going to do, even for uh, traditional protocols, it can be hard to understand what their performance would be. Um, and there's a lot of emerging protocols now because there's been a big need for better rate control, uh, especially in the last few years. So how do we understand if these protocols are robust to different environments? And we, um, the approach we've been exploring recently to, to help understand that is using machine learning as an adversary. So imagine here that you have your algorithm that you want to test. Uh, it might be a learning-based control agent. It might be um, a, a load balancer. Um, it could be a lot of different 
things. Okay, there's two endpoints, and there's some environment that they're running in. So you can run that, run it in that environment, and uh, feed observations about how well it performs to this adversary, which sees those observations. And what the adversary is trying to do, uh, it outputs the environmental parameters. Okay, which is a sequence across time. And it gets rewarded when it finds environmental parameters that cause this algorithm under test to perform poorly. Okay, so it's looking for the hard cases. Now you can't just say, well, I'm gonna drop all packets. Okay, that'll be poor performance, but it won't be very interesting. So you have to do this carefully. You have to reward it for suboptimal performance of the algorithm. And we have some smoothing and so on to make this um, more, uh, more useful results to see. Um, so we implemented this for ABR video and also for congestion control. And I'll just show two quick results. Um, the, the agent was able to find for BBR that it could get BBR to significantly drop its uh, throughput with just some small fluctuations in latency if they're well-timed. So it was able to find basically the probing phase of BBR and um, react to that adversarially. Uh, we also looked at using these adversarial traces as uh, training data for a learning-based agent, the idea to make it um, more robust to unusual conditions. And we did see some improvement there uh, in the fifth percentile quality of experience in ABR. Okay, I'll wrap up now. I uh, just wanted to mention some lessons learned from, from this line of work. Um, some things worked and some things were, were pretty challenging. First of all, the modular architecture here um, worked pretty well, separating out the control algorithm from the utility function. <clears throat> if we look back at a lot of the work I talked about and some others, uh, it can be seen as basically dropping in different or better versions of these two modules. So having that separation was useful for different uh, cases, like uh, one that I didn't talk about was um, new utility functions for mobile networks um, or for the scavenger and hybrid use cases, which we, we talked about a little bit. So that ended up being a very useful separation there um, and allowed us to specialize for different applications. And I think that um, that's, that's an area that's pretty interesting actually for this kind of work in general you can perhaps more easily specialize to applications if you can do it by the application just dropping a new utility function, but keeping the rest of the system the same. Um, <clears throat> Learning-based control we found was actually able to improve, improve performance in many cases over traditional protocols. Um, good implementations also matter here in addition to good algorithms. And I mentioned there's a couple efforts, one uh, by Huawei and Vodafone and one by uh, computer labs that's taking uh, the PCC designs and uh, computers commercializing it uh, for the case of uh, improving video delivery. And that's a startup led by Michael Shapira. Um, <clears throat> so there's also some challenges and future opportunities here. Um, although we did get performance improvement in many cases, uh, it wasn't optimal in some cases. And one of the challenging things there we found was the tension between making fast decisions versus careful decisions. It's definitely useful to have more than one packet's worth of data, but um, you can also react too slowly. In fact, in some environments, even one round trip time can be a long time. So that's a, a challenge in designing these approaches. Um, a second open challenge is just understanding the robustness of protocols. We took a, I talked about uh, some initial uh, initial stab that we took at uh, at that, but that's I think a big area that needs a lot more work and will be pretty exciting. So, just to wrap up, I think this is a really exciting domain. There's an increasing prevalence of complexity in um, network systems and in the environments that they run in and in the needs of different applications. And that means that I think there's a, there's a good opportunity here for inference-based methods um, and learning-based methods generally. But often we'll need to think about how do we restructure the system so that it has a clear goal of performance so they can get the data it needs. How do we restructure our systems for a learning mindset? 
So thanks so much for your attention. If you'd like, you can check out the, the code. And thanks for our sponsors, and especially all of my collaborators and the students and the projects that I mentioned that, uh, that like I said, did all the real work here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brighton. Really, really insightful. I learned a lot. Um, let me ask one of the clarifying questions. I think uh, early on, somebody is asking, why does using scale-free variables increase robustness? Yeah, that's a good question. What I meant by robustness was um, consistent performance as the environment, uh, environmental parameters in the network change. For example, um, you might go from bandwidth of um, anywhere from, you know, uh, one megabit per second up to many gigabits per second, big swings in orders of magnitude uh, there. But in some sense, the algorithm should be doing a similar thing, right? It shouldn't be uh, necessarily that sensitive to the exact absolute values of those parameters there. I see, I see, I see. Actually, kind of maybe a slight follow-up on robustness. I really like the final part of the talk, talking about robustness and using ML for as an adversary. I wonder if through this analysis, did you ever find some situations where we shouldn't really use learning-based algorithms or a congestion control algorithm that we designed? Was there like a clear cut scenario that some algorithm is a no-no? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> It's, uh, it's hard to say that there's a time when learning-based algorithms broadly shouldn't be used. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think we know enough yet about the space of, of options there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think, uh, in general, the harder cases were these more dynamic environments where I'm not sure that we yet fully captured the time delay effects uh, and the effects of taking some time for your measurements and seeing the results and adapting. Um, and, you know, that was a convenient model to just say, okay, there's, you know, there's a time step, you take an action, you see the results. There's another time step, you take an action, you see the results. Um, but those discrete time steps, like I mentioned, and can in some environments, that can be kind of long um, and there can be delayed um, effects of results because of queuing or, or other things. So those are, I think, some of the more challenging cases that, that are closely related to this, at least the way we set up the learning model. I see. But let me ask you uh, to follow up with this uh, sort of um, uh, time granularity, uh, how much benefit do you see there will be in adapting, you know, now that you have these, uh, these much more adaptive schemes in adapting to the needs of the application? Yeah, I, I think there will be a, um, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity. And mm -hmm. the one that we tackled was this uh, scavenger transport, because right. that's something where um, <clears throat> if you in a way, it's a it's a good place to start because if you're if you're too conservative, well, it's background transport anyway, right? It doesn't matter if it's if it's more delayed, so it's easy to kind of err on the side of being conservative there, and you want to protect the primary flows as much as possible. Um, there's probably a lot of applications where that can be used, um, not not only um, uh, software update, but you know uploading files to cloud storage, or, you know, uh, you can probably think of other, other cases where, you know, the, the flow was not as important as what you really care about. Um, that's not necessarily easy because it has to be wired into applications. They have to realize that their background, they should be um, uh, scavengers, but there's, you know, some classes where that's useful. But then beyond that, um, there are, uh, there are, applications with different requirements, right? Um, uh, Zoom, for example, audio and video right, are gonna need yeah. something different than you know, loading small web pages. And if we could potentially encode that in a utility function, give it to the transport protocol, 
um, then you could potentially get a, a nice benefit there. That 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 would be in you know uh, something that itself is involves some interesting work because uh, you have to understand what the utility function is. Um, I think you know that's one of the interesting things here is that many of these systems have not. Uh, they don't currently have like an explicitly defined objective. And so that's mm -hmm. part of the work in, in making them learning based. Okay. Actually, this discussion kind of makes me wonder about, Brighton, have you thought about learning based for DNN training workload, like the kind of workload that Pavan was mm -hmm. talking about right before? Or are you just targeting internet traffic? Yeah, we. Uh, that's a great question. I think that would be that. That's an you know an open question. We mostly for this work have looked at um, um, you know public internet congestion control. I think you know the reason for that was mostly that congestion control within the data center, you have opportunity for more information about mm -hmm. what's happening in the network um, compared to the public internet. It's it, it's a lot like a black box. Uh, there's, you know, you, you can't coordinate with different ISPs to, to deploy a new protocol, but you can do that in the data center and it's been done. Um, but, um, but potentially that extra information you get in the data center, uh, knowledge about applications or overall uh, traffic patterns, uh, you know, potentially that could be just additional inputs into a learning algorithm. Maybe it could uh, it could still help out. So I think that's a that's a great question, and it's uh, it's an open problem. Yeah, yeah, it's probably useful to. I've been thinking about a lot of these learning based or an alternative congestion control algorithm for mm -hmm. machine learning, and it would be kind mm -hmm. of I'm curious to maybe we should apply actually a learning based algorithm for learning. Workload that would be it's fitting uh, somehow it's, yes yeah yeah and then cyclical <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay there's a kind of a clarifying question might give you a maybe just show you how some people pay attention to the type of congestion control algorithm somebody's asking whether you consider Tahoe or Reno the kind of early in the talk when you were talking about the CC algorithm I wonder if you have yeah thoughts on that yeah there um. We, we looked at a, a number of different protocols. I think there were like at least half a dozen, maybe a dozen that we compared with, um, especially in the first paper, um, the, the one in NSDI 2015, um, I think had the most comparisons, if I recall correctly, just because at that time, I think um, uh, there wasn't yet an understanding of uh, of the the scope of the problem and how much opportunity there was for improvement. So at that point, you know, it's a it's a valid question. Okay, there are a lot of TCPs out there. You know, are you sure this is really a problem with um, the the whole method? Do we really need a whole new architecture? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're just using the wrong TCP out of the hundreds that have been proposed. Um, I don't think we covered that whole space of hundreds uh, in all proposed research papers, but you'll find a number of them there. Right, right. Yeah, I remember the paper has many, many plots, many, many curves in one plot. Yes. Yeah, the the, the lead student mode did did a, a huge number of experiments <laughs> with that paper. Very yeah. significant amount of work. Yes, yeah. so I guess you have two more questions. Let me just read them to you. Is there any significant trade-off between the computation cost for implementing RL algorithm on each node and the congestion control benefits we are seeing because of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the computational cost was not partic uh, particularly high. I, I don't remember a number to quote, but we generally didn't have problems with the control algorithm itself mm -hmm. um, in computation class in, in any of the approaches that I talked about. Um, now, what's a, a, a bit more of a cost that's related to that is um, the difference between working in user space and kernel space, um, both in efficiency going in and out of the kernel, 
Uh, and it's way easier to, especially a, a, a deep learning based method is way easier to implement in user space. Um, and if you are in the, in the kernel, then um, you know, there's some uh, more constraints in what you can implement and how convenient it is to do that. Um, so that was a struggle earlier on when we tried to implement uh, kernel based um, implementations of these protocols. And, you know, honestly, one answer that, to that is that um, that's what you do when you want to, you know, productize something at that point, it's probably worth the time. Um, but also more generally, I think in the research community, this is not the only um, uh, area where it becomes convenient to, uh, to extend what the kernel does. And there's, um, you know, there's uh, generally, I think, a push in making host-based networking more simultaneously efficient and um, extensible. And, you know, those, uh, those methods like um, the, uh, um, uh, I think CCP project, if I remember the name correctly, um, from MIT uh, for congestion control, factoring yes. that out particularly. And then other, you know, other, um, methods for uh, making, generally making um, networking tasks fast on the end hose, I think, or that whole landscape is changing pretty quickly and there's new technologies mm -hmm. there, eBPF and so on. Right, right. One last question. This is also a good one. How do you think of using learning-based algorithms to tackle microburst problems in data centers? That could be very interesting. Yeah. 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 I think that's a, a, a good point. Going back to the earlier discussion, um, maybe that's a case where, you know, uh, you don't have time to, to coordinate with a central agent. You maybe not, don't even have time for end-to-end -end signaling. Um, you have to do something more statistical and learning-based. That could be pretty interesting. Right, right, right. right. Yes, yes. Well, with that, thank you so much, Brighton. It was a very clear... Uh, talk. I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, thanks for to everybody who attended. We are going to take a break until 1 p.m. Eastern and uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. Then we'll come back for our last but not least talk of the day. Thank you all. See you at one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.